Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to wish you all a, uh, a belated uh, Eid Mubarak. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the tawfiq once again to continue our reflections on Surah Al Anbiya. And we left off uh, at verse number nine, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thumma sadaqnahum al-wa'da fa'anjaynahum wa man nasha'u wa ahlakna al-musrifeen. Allah says in verse number nine, then we fulfilled the promise to them and saved them and whomsoever we willed and we destroyed the transgressors. In the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was sharing the confrontations and the, the discussions between the Prophet and the Mushrikeen. And there was a lot of back and forth. The, the disbelievers, the opponents of the divine message would taunt, they would ridicule, they would make accusations, and the Prophet would respond to their attacks in the most dignified and noble way. So in the previous verses, there is, there is this struggle between the proponents of truth and the proponents of falsehood, between the army of Haq and the army of Batil. And then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, ثُمَّ صَدَقْنَاهُمُ الْوَعْدِ Now in the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, answering one of the, uh, the, uh, the arguments of the mushrikeen, saying that, you know, why is it, uh, you know, this man, Muhammad, is nothing but a human being. He's nothing but a human being. What makes him special? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds by saying, وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ In verse number 8, وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامِ وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ We did not make them, meaning the prophets, bodies that did not eat food, nor were they immortal. So here the pronoun, then we fulfilled the promise to them, ثُمَّ صَدَقْنَاهُمُ الْوَعْدِ goes back to the prophets, the messengers. So here Allah says, then we fulfilled the promise to them and saved them and whomsoever we willed, and we destroyed the transgressors. The verse begins with the word thumma. And in Arabic, the word thumma, as the, as the Mufassirin say, yufidu tarahi. Thumma means after some time has passed, meaning in the previous verses, Allah was speaking about the struggle this conflict between the people of truth and the people of falsehood, the prophets and their followers and the, the enemies of the prophets and their supporters. Now here Allah says, then we fulfilled the promise to them. Allah is basically saying, thumma, you know, after all, after some time, after it's all said and done, we fulfilled the promise to them. Allah is saying that I had I made a promise. And here it's it's used in the past tense. And this is a way of consoling the Prophet. Because the Prophet in Mecca, he's currently experiencing this struggle, this conflict, this resistance from his people. Allah is saying about the previous prophets, then we fulfilled Sadaqnahum. It's a past tense verb. Thumma Sadaqnahum al we fulfilled the promise. The divine promise was fulfilled. Now the question here is, what is this divine promise that Allah is speaking about? What is the divine promise that will, will be realized? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses in the Quran, He makes mention of this promise, a promise that He makes to His prophets, to his messengers, and to the believers in general. For example, if you go to Surah 58, verse number 21, 
Allah says, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ God has decreed, it has been written, meaning that this is not something that, is, that can be reversed. It is set in stone. كَتَبَ اللَّهُ Allah has written, He has decreed what? لَأَغْلِبَنَّ أَنَا وَرُسُلِي that me and my messengers will surely gain victory. Why? In Allah Qawiyun Aziz, because God is all powerful, He is Almighty. Now, what does it mean? What does Allah mean when He says that we will be victorious? Because if you look at the history of prophets, the majority of the prophets. They were murdered, they were killed, they were oppressed. So what is this victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about? That we granted, that we fulfilled the promise. The fulfillment of the promise, as we will come to see, is in the fact that, number one, the message has not died. So even though the prophets were killed, the messengers were massacred in large numbers. The reality is the message has survived. So even though the messengers have been killed, even though the messengers are not among us today, the message, the message has still survived. And the complete fulfillment of the divine promise will be realized with the reappearance of the 12th Imam. That's when the message will be made public, it will be manifest, and the world will be ruled according to the law of God. When it's all said and done, after this fighting, this back and forth, Allah says, in the end, my promise will be fulfilled. We fulfilled the promise to them. Not only has the promise been fulfilled, but Allah says, and He saved them. He saved the messengers. Now, as I said, they may not have been saved in the physical sense, but they were saved, meaning that their message was saved. Everything that happened to these prophets and to these messengers was in the interest of their akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the prophets from the plots and the manipulations of their enemies. So sadaqnahum and fa'anjainahum past tense. Now this is not something that is just related to the past. Allah says, وَمَن نَشَاءَ And whomsoever we will. نَشَاءَ is present and future tense. Meaning that this divine promise that, that was fulfilled for the past prophets and the fact that past prophets and messengers were saved, meaning their messages were saved, the same will apply to whomsoever Allah wills in the present and the, in the future. Meaning that this is a sunnah of Allah. This is a divine policy. That those who stand for the truth, they will be preserved. What they fight for, what they struggle for, will be preserved. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَأَهْلَكْنَا الْمُسْرِفِينَ so on one side, you have the prophets, the messages of the prophets and the messengers are preserved. They are saved. Their akhirah is secured. Their message is protected. وَأَهْلَكْنَا الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah, And Allah says, and we destroyed the transgressors. Musrifin comes from the word israf. Musrifin are basically those who cross, they exceed the limits of decency and morality. 
So, you know, it's one thing to step over the line. That's not what Israf is. Israf is to go so far beyond the limits that you can't even see the, 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 the boundaries in your rearview mirror. You've gone so far in your transgression. And this is one of the indicators of Allah's mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not destroy nations. He does not destroy people unless they are what? Unless they're musrifin, unless they go too far. Minor mis mistakes, minor shortcomings, Allah is forgiving. Allah gives people chances. He gives them respite. But when you become one of the musrifin, meaning that you have gone so far beyond the boundaries that have been set by God and even your conscience, when you go too far, when you exceed the limits, that is when the divine punishment descends. ثُمَّ صَدَقْنَاهُمُ الْوَعْدِ فَأَنْجَيْنَاهُمْ وَمَنْ نَشَاءُ وَأَهْلَكْنَا الْمُسْرِفِينَ If you look at Surah Safat, again, going back to this, this concept of the divine promise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Safat, Surah 37, verses 171, to 173, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ سَبَقَتْ كَلِمَتُنَا That it has been decreed, it's been said and done. وَلَقَدْ سَبَقَتْ كَلِمَتُنَا لِعِبَادِنَا الْمُرْسَلِينَ That there was a promise made to the messengers. سَبَقَتْ كَلِمَتُنَا Meaning that this is something that has been ordained. What has been ordained? What is the promise? Surely them and them alone, they are the ones who will be helped and supported. Mansur comes from the word Nasara. Nasara is to help. Mansur is to be helped. But Allah says, it has been ordained to my messengers that they will be supported. They will be helped. And then Allah says, this is with respect to the messengers. وَإِنَّ جُنْدَنَا لَهُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ And our soldiers, those who fight for the truth, those who support the messengers, the army of God, as the, as the verse says, وَإِنَّ جُنْدَنَا Our army, our, our supporters, وَإِنَّ جُنْدَنَا لَهُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ They are the ones who are triumphant. If you go to Surah Ali Imran, verse number 139, you know, when the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina and they, they experienced these battles with the Mushrikeen and there were casualties, many of the, you know, especially after the Battle of Uhud, many of the Muslims were demoralized. They thought that that's it. We are going to be defeated by the disbelievers. Allah says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Do not feel weak. Do not grieve. Do not deem yourself weak. Do not be, do not be grief-stricken. وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ So there is a divine promise to messengers and there is also a divine promise to you and I. وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Don't be overcome and overwhelmed by your enemies, by the sophistication of their resources, by their propaganda machines, by their hostility. Why? Why should you not deem yourself weak? Why should you not grieve? Allah, Allah says, you will be the higher ones. You will have the upper hand under one condition. وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ You will be triumphant. You will have the upper hand. Under one condition, إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ If you are truly believers, if you have iman, you might go through the ups and downs, but in the end, you will be triumphant. The story will end well for you. 
So here the message for us, so even though Allah is speaking about prophets, the ayah also is a reminder that there is a divine promise that has been given to you and I. And that is, it's, and it's a very simple promise. Allah basically is telling us, fulfill your duty and I will fulfill my promise. Fulfill your duty and I will fulfill my, my promise. وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Verse number 10. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Allah says, we have indeed sent down to you a book wherein is your reminder. Do you not understand? Laqad, we have indeed. Anzalna ilaykum. We have sent down to you. Allah is speaking to who? He's speaking to the enemies of the Prophet, to the Mushrikeen, that this book is for you. It has been sent down to you. Kitaban. Now in Arabic, some nouns are either ma'rifa or nakira, meaning they're either definite or indefinite. So for example, if the verse said, Laqad anzalna ilaykum al kitab, if there was an alif and lam in front of kitab, we would call that ma'rifa in the Arabic language. That would be a definite noun. But here the word kitab is nakira. Nakira meaning it is an indefinite noun. And this is a rhetorical device in the Arabic language. And in this instance, it's used for ta'zim. That this is a book that is great. A book has been sent down to you. It's for ta'zim. This book contains what? Fihi dhikrukum. A book wherein is your reminder. Now what, is the, what does it mean when it says Fihi dhikrukum? Now Fihi dhikrukum could mean that it is a reminder for you, that this book is a reminder that God rewards the good doers and he punishes the evil doers. It's a book that reminds you of your obligations. It reminds you of what God has prohibited. But there are other mufassireen that say that no, the, the, the meaning of fihi dhikrukum is not, is not a reference to reminder. What it means is dhikr here means nobility, dignity, and honor. That, so the meaning of the verse would be we have indeed sent down to you a book wherein in it is your honor and your dignity and your nobility if you follow it. Meaning that if you want honor, if you want nobility, if you want dignity, this Quran guides you to a noble life. It guides you towards a dignified life, a life of honor. Now, why do, what's the argument? How do they support this, this opinion? They say, some of the mufassireen of the Quran, they say that, if you go to Surah 94, you know, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak, verse number four, Surah 94, verse number four, what does Allah say about the Prophet? And we have elevated your dhikr, meaning your honor, your dignity. We have elevated your nobility. Because, you know, one example is that every day, five times a day or three times a day, the name of the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned immediately after the name of God. That Allah has honored the Prophet. After we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, after we bear witness to the oneness of God, after we say there is no God but God, immediately after that we say, Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. That we bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. So because the name of the Prophet has been eternally connected to the name of God, God has elevated his honor and his nobility. So here, the commentators of the Quran, they say, when Allah says, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابٍ We have 
sent down to you a book, a great book, that in it is your honor, in it is your nobility and your dignity, that if you want to be a noble person, if you want to live a life of dignity and honor, that this Qur'an is the perfect guide. Don't you use your reason, don't you use your intellect? Meaning that if you use your aql and you approach the Qur'an objectively and you use the faculty of reason, you, look, you examine the Qur'an logically, you set aside any biases that you have, that you will come to the conclusion that this is a book that guides towards that which is upright. It guides towards a noble life, a dignified life. Verse number 11. وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ كَانَتْ ظَالِمَةٌ وَأَنْشَأْنَا بَعْدَهَا قَوْمًا آخرين. Allah says, how many a town engaged in wrongdoing have we shattered and then brought into being another people after them? The word kem means how many? وَكَمْ وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرِيَةٍ So the verse begins with a, uh, a rhetorical question. Now, it's a rhetorical question. When Allah says, how many a town engaged in wrongdoing have we shattered? The meaning of the verse is that, you know, kem here, yufidu takthir. It means many. You know, it's, it's like when when a mother tells her kids, how many times have I told you to clean your room? Is she, is she waiting for an actual answer? She's not. It's a rhetorical question to mean, to indicate that I've told you many times to clean your room. Here, similarly, Allah is saying what? When Allah says, وَكَمْ قَصَنَّا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ كَانَتْ ظَالِمَةٍ how many a town engaged in wrongdoing have we shattered? The idea here is that many nations, many towns, many cities in the past, they engaged in wrongdoing and Allah annihilated them. It's a very sad part of human history that so many nations, so many groups of people in the past, they defied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, وَكَمْ قَصَنَّا It's an interesting verse. It's an interesting verb that's used. You know, the word, the word qasam, there are some v- verbs in the Arabic language that, that are similar to the word qasam. So we're, f- we're familiar with the word kasara. Kasara is to, to break something. Uh, fasama, for example. Fasama is also to break. So, for example, if you have a, if you have a, a, a dish and you, you break the, the dish, or fasama. Fasama and qasama, the difference between qasama and fasama is just one dot. Qasama begins with qaf. Fasama begins with fa. In the Arabic language, fasama means to break something. So for example, you have a dish and it breaks and say it, just, it breaks down the middle. There's a crack in it. Fasana. But qasana is, is different. It's a much more forceful verb. Qasana means that the dish has been shattered into a million pieces. To shatter. To pulverize. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ كَانَتْ ظَالِمًا So here in this verse, Allah is elaborating. He's providing an elaboration of the promise that was mentioned in verse number 9. ثُمَّ صَدَقْنَاهُمُ الْوَعْدِ And we fulfilled the promise to them. This is an example of the divine promise that he, he protects the messengers, he saves them, and he 
punishes the transgressors. And in some cases, the punishment is so severe that it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he shatters them. He annihilates them. He pulverizes them to such an extent that, it, you know, when you, when you break something, sometimes it maintains its structural integrity. You might break a dish, but still, you know, there's just a crack. What qasam means to completely obliterate. Why does Allah say qasam? وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ Why does Allah forcefully destroy these people? What did they do? What was the crime that warrants such an intense punishment? وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا You know, in, uh, speaking of the word qasama, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he uses this verb when he says, قَصَمَ ظَهْرِ إِثْنَانِ عَالِمٌ مُتَهَتِّكْ وَجَاهِلٌ متنسك. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, there are two types of people who have shattered my back. قَصَمَ ظَهْرِ They've pulverized my back. They've caused me so much pain and agony. Two groups of people. عَالِمٌ متهتك, An immoral scholar. Because uh, when an alim is corrupt, it can cause a lot of damage. It can cause a nation to deviate. Alimun mutahatik wa jahilun mutanasik. And a zeal as a fanatic, ignorant person. An ignorant person who's religious. A zealous ignoramus. Jahilun mutanasik. So what was the crime? Why does Allah punish these people so severely? Kanat Valima. Because they were what? Because they committed dhulm. There's nothing, my dear brothers and sisters, that causes divine wrath to descend more than dhulm, more than oppression. Now, what is the meaning of dhulm? Now, dhulm is the opposite of adl. You have someone who's dhalim and someone who's adl. What's the difference? Adl is wadhu shay. Justice is to put everything in its proper place. And therefore, dhulm is to misappropriate. It's to put things where they don't belong. This is why shirk is known as dhulmun azim, as Luqman says to his son, Ya Bunay, la tushrik billah. Do not ascribe partners to God. Why? Inna shirka la dhulmun azim because shirk is a great dhulm. Why? Because you are placing your worship, your servitude in a place that is not where it's supposed to be. Veneration and worship should be placed with God and you're placing it in something else. You're misappropriating ubudiyya. You're putting, you're putting something in its improper place. You're misappropriating worship, adoration, veneration. So dhulm is much broader than just violating the rights of another person. It extends to even dhulm against the self, shirk. So dhulm is a very broad concept. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he has many beautiful ahadith about dhulm, about the danger of dhulm. The Imam, alayhi salam, he says, al-dhulm yuzillu al-qadam. Dhulm, especially dhulm against others. You know, dhulm against yourself. If you miss Salatul Fajr, that's an act of oppression against the self. And Allah may pardon you, but when it comes to oppressing and wronging others, this is where there's a limit to divine mercy. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not gonna, he's not gonna just overlook those transgressions. So Amir al muminin he says, al-qadam, that oppression, wrongdoing, especially against others, makes the feet slip. Meaning that when you commit dhulm, you are much more susceptible to other forms of deviation. You lose the tawfiq of hidayah. 
So the Imam speaks about three, three consequences of ظلم. Number one is that you become susceptible to misguidance. You lose the tawfiq of hidayah. Number one. Blessings are taken away from you. If you want to preserve the blessings and the favors that Allah has bestowed upon you, then don't oppress people. Don't commit dhulm. umam. The third consequence of dhulm, especially when it becomes widespread and it becomes systemic, you know, you have structural oppression, it destroys nations. If you look at the nations of the past, in many cases, the downfall of many of these civilizations was what? Dhulm. Oppression, social, economic, whatever it may be. In another hadith, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Wallah, la in abita ala hasak is sa'adani musahada, o ujarra fil aglali musafada, a habu ilayamin and al kallaha wa rasulahu yom al qiyamati valiman, li ba'dul ibad. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, he says, I swear by God, I would rather lay on a bed of spikes, on a bed of thorns, awake all night, or be, I'd rather be dragged in shackles in the streets. That would be easier for me. That would be more dear to me than meeting Allah and His Messenger on the Day of Judgment while I have oppressed some of his servants. That look at the type of fear that Amir al mumin has with respect to dhulm. He says, I'd rather lay on a bed of spikes all night. I would rather be in shackles and in chains in dunya than meet Allah and his messenger on the day of judgment as a valim. The day of judgment is very severe for the valimi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَكَمْ قَصَمْنَا مِنْ قَرِيَةٍ كَانَتْ ظَالِمًا How many a town engaged in wrongdoing have we shattered? And then what does Allah say? Not only does Allah annihilate these people, وَأَنْشَأْنَا بَعْدَهَا قَوْمًا آخَرِينَ Allah says, and then brought into being another people after them. You know, some of us, some nations, they think that they're indispensable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not only are you indis not only will I annihilate you, not only am I able to completely obliterate you, I will bring about another people that will replace you, and you will become forgotten. And the word Allah uses is nasha'a, right? وَأَنْشَأْنَا بَعْدَهَا قَوْمًا آخرين. There's a difference between خَلَقَ and نَشَأَ خَلَقَ means to create But نَشَأَ means to create to nurture to foster and to allow something to bloom Meaning that Allah says that How many a town engaged in wrongdoing have we shattered? So not only, Allah says, not only will I obliterate them, you will become forgotten. And I will repl replace you with another group who I will nurture, who will grow and who will bloom. And I will raise them up to such an extent that you will become forgotten. You know, some of us, we think we're so important that if we leave this life, people are going to grieve for us until Yom Al-Qiyamah. That's not the case. Allah says, no. There are entire nations that existed before you. And this is a very powerful lesson to Quraysh, the enemies of the Prophet. There were so many who came before you. Where are they? No one even talks about them. They were replaced. You are replaceable. Allah is telling the enemies of the Prophet, the supporters of Batil, the enemies of God and his messengers and his prophets that, you know, you, if you continue with this dhulm, you will be annihilated and you will be forgotten. You will be completely 
replaced. And this is, this is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Isra, verse 17, again, Allah, a similar message is echoed. وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنَ الْقُرُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِ نُوحِ Allah says, and how many generations were destroyed after Nuh? You know, you would think after the great flood of Nuh that people would, you know, be more cautious. But Allah says, no, many of them, many of the people that came after Nuh, they went back to their old ways. They transgressed, they were arrogant, they were rebellious. And how many generations were destroyed after Nuh? وَكَفَى بِرَبِّكَ بِذُنُوبِ عِبَادِهِ خَبِيرًا مصر. It was because of their, their sins, their rebelliousness, their iniquities. Verse number 12. So again, Allah now is going to give us. So he speaks about this idea that the promise of God was fulfilled for the past messengers. And part of the promise is that those who exceed the limits are destroyed. And they're destroyed in the most forceful way because of their wrongdoing, because of their dhulm. And then Allah here in verse number 12, He gives us a glimpse into the reaction of the people when punishment descends. When the severe chastisement descends upon them, Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّوا بَأْسَنَا إِذَا هُمْ مِنْهَا يَرْكُضُونَ it's a very powerful verse. Allah says, and when they felt our might, here, Ba'sana means the punishment, the divine punishment. And when they felt our might, behold, they ran away from it. So here Allah says, they haven't even experienced it yet. So whether it's a hurricane, a tsunami, whether they hear the rumbling of an earthquake, whatever it may be, whatever the natural disaster is. Allah says, when they sense it, you know, when a, when a little bit of that rain falls, whatever the, the way in which Allah chooses to annihilate them, Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَحَسُّ When they sense that things are changing, that punishment has descended, إِذَاهُمْ مِنْهَا يَرْكُضُونَ يَرْكُضُونَ is an interesting verb. They don't walk away. They don't, they don't even run. You know, يَفِرُّ They don't flee. يَرْكُضُونَ يَرْكُضُونَ is to run in a way that you didn't even think you were capable of doing. You know when your adrenaline is running? You know, there's, if I tell you to run a 100-meter dash on an average day, you might get an average time. But if there's a ferocious beast chasing you, believe me, you're going to run like Hussein Bolt. The adrenaline is pumping. Yarkulun means that they run with adrenaline. They run faster than they have ever ran. And this is before they even experienced the divine punishment. They sensed it. They felt that it was approaching. They see that volcanic eruption. They see, they feel the trembling of the earth. They see the tornado coming, whatever it may be. They sense it with their five senses. They see it. They hear it. They feel it. They run frantically, striking the earth in panic. There's a hadith from Imam al-Baqir, our fifth Imam, he says that this ayah will be fully realized with the appearance of the 12th Imam. 
الإمام الباقر سز ذلك عند قيام القائم عجل الله تعالى فرج that this will happen when they see the might you know especially those who oppose صاحب العصر والزمان and when they felt our might they will see that the Imam is too powerful that they will they will retreat so Imam al Baqarah says this ayah at least on some level is a reference to something that will happen in the future to the Imam when the Imam rises that the enemies those who were hostile those who have who are benefiting from the way that the world works today that they benefit from from the status quo when the when the when they witness when they feel our might because that is sometimes used in the arabic language to refer to a military power and here imam al-baqir says that this is a reference to the military power of the uh, the 12th imam falamma ahassu ba'sana idha hum minha yarkudun and then in verse 13 la tarkudu وَارْجِعُوا إِلَى مَا أُتْرِفْتُمْ فِيهِ وَمَسَاكِنِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُسْأَلُونَ Do not run away. Now who is saying this? There's a difference of opinion. Some say that this is Allah speaking. Others say that it's the malaika, the, the angels of punishment, who are saying this. Do not run away, but return to the luxury you have been given and to your dwellings that perhaps you may be questioned. So here, it's, it's as though the malaika are taunting them. In the same way they used to taunt the messengers and the prophets. So they're running. As they're running, the angels presumably are saying, do not run away, but return to the luxury you have, you have, been, you have, been, you have been given. From the word taraf, the word taraf means to, to indulge, to live lavishly. You know, just to give you a, a, an example, you know, some of us, we live comfortable lives. You know, we have a small family, three, four members, and we have three, four bedroom houses, maybe five bedroom houses. You're living comfortably. But, but taraf is, for example, if you have, you know, you're, you're, you and your wife, and you have two kids, if you have a four-bedroom house, this is not taraf. You're living comfortably, alhamdulillah. You're living much more comfortably than most people. But taraf is to be a four-member family, husband and wife and two kids, and you have eight bedrooms, ten bedrooms. This is taraf. You know, you, you drive a $300,000 car. And say you, you make $100,000 a year. This is taraf. This is very excessive. So these people that Allah speaks about, when the punishment came to them, they were so engrossed in materialism. They overindulged. And this shows you the dangers of indulging too much in dunya. This is why it's important to always give sadaqah, to give charity, to don't... To, Protect your heart from hubbud dunya. And Allah says that we gave them this luxury. If you look at the verse, لا تركض وارجعوا إلى ما أترفتم فيه The luxury you have been given. Meaning that Allah gave them this luxury. So sometimes when Allah gives you a lot of material blessings, when He gives you material enjoyments, it's actually not a reward. It's a punishment. If you go to Surah Al-An'am, verse 44, Surah 6, verse 44, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ When they forgot what they were supposed to remember, they forgot Allah, they forgot the Akhirah, they were heedless, how does Allah punish them? فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ because they were heedless, Allah says, I opened the doors for all things. Meaning, I opened up the floodgates of dunya for them. I, I gave them the dunya on a silver platter. Hatta idha farihu bima utu. Until they became very pleased 
and very jubilant over what they were given. We seize them suddenly. And they were bankrupt. They had nothing. They did not make use of the wealth and the sustenance that we gave them. And sometimes Allah gives you dunya, He gives you material blessings as a reward. Surah 7, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 96, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا If the people of the village, if the people believed and they were pious, لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ If they only believed and if they were pious, we would have opened up the blessings, barakat, from the heavens and the earth. The difference between when Allah gives to a non-believer and when Allah gives to a believer is that Allah puts barakah in the wealth and in the goods of, that He gives to a believer. When Allah gives dunya to a mu'min, He puts barakah in it. And the meaning of barakah is what? That you are able to do more with less. That there's barakah in your wealth. Even if Allah gives you a little bit, it goes a long way. Allah puts barakah in your time. So barakah is the ability to do more with less. So it's not about the quantity of dunya that Allah gives you. It's about the quality of the dunya that he gives you, the material gifts that he gives you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُسْأَلُونَ So you can be questioned. Again, this is a kind of rhetorical device alluded to the impossibility of escaping that punishment that has descended. قَالُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ They said, O oh, woe unto us. Truly we have been wrongdoers. It's amazing that when, when people face their death, when they face their end, their fitra becomes activated. Their consciousness comes to, comes to life. They, they realize that they were, they were living immorally. They realize that they were misguided. They realize that they did not treat these blessings as they should have been treated. But such admission is too late. You know, it's like Fir'aun. When Fir'aun confessed his belief in Allah, the Lord of Musa and Harun, it wasn't accepted from him. And Imam al-Ridha was asked, he says, because at that, po at that point, Alam al-Akhira was opening up in his eyes. That you have now, the veil has been lifted. And with these people, forgiveness is not given to them because when that punishment descends, the veil also has been lifted. And we'll end with this verse. فَمَا زَالَتْ تِلْكَ دَعْوَاهُمْ حَتَّى جَعَلْنَاهُمْ حَصِيدًا خَامِدِينَ And that did not cease to be their cry till we made them a moan field stilled. Allah says that they were saying يَا وَيْلَنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ until their souls left their body. They felt disgrace they felt pity for themselves Allah says this is the state of those who defy my messengers who rebel who transgress they die in this state in a state of humiliation Allah says this is their call until the very last until the bitter end and we made them into what Hasidan Khamidin. You know, Hasid is, you know, when you cut the grass, when you mow the lawn, and the cut grass kind of sprinkles all over the lawn. You know, it's kind of jumbled up sticks and twigs and cut grass. That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them. You know, when Allah in the Quran, He he compares and he contrasts believers with disbelievers. For example, and he uses this analogy of vegetation, plants. So, for example, when Allah speaks about Maryam, 
when Maryam السلام, was adopted by uh, when she was taken under the guardianship of uh, Zakaria in Surah Ali Imran verse 37 Allah says وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا Nabat means plant. Allah says we, we placed her in a good place for her to grow. That we put her in an, in an environment that was conducive for her growth. Growth. Like the way that a plant grows when it's given enough water and enough sunlight. That's how her upbringing was in, under the care of Zakaria. But here Allah, when he speaks about the mushrikeen, they're like cut grass. That when the grass is cut from the root, it dies immediately. It's dead. And then when, when you want to get rid of that cut grass, it becomes dry very quickly. And Allah says, khamidin. Khamidin is when you burn something that is dry. When grass becomes dry and you set it on fire, it ignites immediately. Within seconds, it becomes what? It becomes ash. And it's like it never existed. And this is the condition of the enemies of God. That they're just like that mowed lawn, that grass, that when it burns, you burn it, and it's gone. It gets swept away by the wind, and it's like it never existed. And if you look at the enemies of the prophets, whether it's Namrud, whether it's Fir'aun, whether it's the enemies of Imam al Hussein, the enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you look around today, no one even mentions them. It's like they didn't even exist. You know, Muawiyah at one time, he had an entire kingdom. But look at the dome of Ali ibn Abi Talib and look at Muawiyah. That they're gone. Ja'alnahum hasidan khamidin. So the way that you get rid of this dry grass is you burn it and it's gone. Within moments, it vanishes like it never existed. And this is the divine promise that those who stand for truth, who align themselves with the divine message, who are the supporters of the prophets and the messengers, Allah will immortalize them. And those who stand in opposition, they're like that cut grass, that hasid, that dies, becomes dry, and it's burned, and it becomes ash, and it gets taken with the wind. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and allow us to witness the fulfillment of the divine promise. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi You know, the, the, word, the word baraka, according to... Uh, to Arab linguists, some say that it comes from the word birka, which is basically, it refers to kind of a, a body of water that is, uh, that is still. And uh, it, it kind of, it denotes something that's, uh, that remains. You know, after, after it rains, for example, you have a birka. You have an area where water is collected. And even after, after the rain is gone, that, that puddle remains. So baraka, it comes from this idea of something that is good, that endures, something that lasts. You know, and, uh, and that's why, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, in Surah uh, Al-Mulk, you know, tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. That baraka is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you dedicate, when you do anything for the sake of Allah, you have that, that element of barakah. It, become, it endures. It lasts. That, whatever you do for Allah, it endures. And everything that is done for other than Allah, it perishes. And when you do something for the sake of Allah, no matter what the quantity is, it will endure. So, we, so that, that's what I mean by, you know, Baraka, one of the implications of Baraka is that you're able to do more with less. You know, just like with, uh, with uh, the Ahlul Bayt, 
you know, even though their resources were very limited, they were able to achieve a lot. You know, for example, we're speaking about the barakah of time, you know, to, to, to do more with less. Fatima to Zahra السلام, lived 18 years, 18 lunar years, I might add, a very short life. So even though her time on, uh, in this life was very limited, it was a very small amount of time, but she was able to do so much good with that little bit of time. Why? Because her life had barakah. Same thing with wealth. You know, there might be someone who makes $300,000 a year, but he doesn't get the tawfiq to go to hajj. He has a lot, but he cannot do anything with, 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 these, uh, with these resources. And, that, and then you might have someone who lives in one of the villages of Africa. He lives a very simple, humble life, but with his small means, he's able to go to hajj. So this idea of, of barakah the ability to do more with less. Why? Because of your intention. If you, if you adjust and you fine tune your intention and you do things fi sabilillah, you'll, you'll be able to achieve a lot even if your resources are very limited. So yeah, that, that, that would be another example. And in fact, some of the mufassireen, when they, when they discuss these verses, you know, especially... You know, if you go back to uh, verse number nine, that this was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hinting at the conquest of Mecca. So, you know, the Muslims are a minority, they're vulnerable, they're surrounded by their enemies. They're, uh, so this was kind of a foreshadowing of the conquest of Mecca. Yeah, so yeah, so when the Prophet conquered Mecca, you know, some of his most staunch enemies uh, retreated, you know, they were literally running when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca. So this this is something, according to Imam al-Baqir, that this is something uh, that will be witnessed on a grand scale with the uh, with the zuhur of the uh, of the twelfth Imam. Not necessarily. We don't know. Only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala can, or or prophets or imams, people who have ilm al ghayb can comment. Uh, about uh, whether a natural disaster is uh, is a punishment uh, or not, we don't know. But we do know that in the past that this has been one of the ways in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, punishes. And those and and one could say that you know how about the you know the children and those who are innocent among them, you know. If, the casualties in these natural disasters, you know, if they're innocent, at the end of the day, they're returning to the most merciful Lord. So it's not that, you know, they were punished and, you know, their death is a punishment. No, for, for, certain, for certain individuals, it's a punishment. For others, it's not. So we, we can't look at the world today and say, okay, there was an earthquake in this part of the world. It's because these people were musrifin. Only... The only Allah, only the prophets, the imams can uh, can can make a conclusive statement like that, and we should definitely refrain from commenting on the reason why these natural phenomenons are taking place. This is not our jurisdiction. Yeah, dur during the time of the prophet, no one really emerged as uh, as a scholar because you know everyone deferred to the uh, the prophet because he was the 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 undisputed authority in his lifetime. So after the, uh, the death of the prophet, again, you have people who, who come forward and they're scholars, they claim to be scholars in the sense that they are most familiar with the sunnah of the prophet. So after the death of the prophet, you definitely see claimants who, who believe that they have superior knowledge as to what constitutes the sunnah of the prophet or not. But during the time of the prophet, I can't think of someone who could be called uh, an immoral scholar. But definitely, I mean, definitely after the death of the prophet. So both, I mean, li living, living beyond your means, you know, in, in some cases it can be, uh, 
forbidden. It's a type of israq. Uh, and and uh, and of course, you know, uh, not fulfill, you know, not fulfilling your obligations is is also another instance. So both both of them would be instances of uh, of Islam. So so you know, in the Islamic tradition, you know, say you want to buy a car. The car that you purchase has to be suitable, has to be in accordance with your social status. So if you're a teacher and you go buy a Ferrari, that, that's not something that is, that's not a normal car for a teacher to drive. And therefore, what is beyond, you know, say it's normal for a, a teacher to drive a $20,000 car and you're driving a $100,000 car, you, you're liable for khums on, on that access, on that access amount. So living beyond your means, yeah, it's, that's not Islamic. So you, your uh, sha'niya is, is what the fuqaha refer to that. It has to be in accordance with your, with your socioeconomic status, that it should be within reason.